Do you see me? Hi, lady. Can you hear me? Chat disabled. Let's see. You can hear me. I can't hear you. Okay. Wait a minute. Can you hear me now? No, your microphone is off. Can you hear me? Annie? Here, here. Oh, oh. Here, here. I can hear the dog. Hi, Peanut. Hi, Peanut. I, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? All right, wait. Now? Now? Can hear? I can't I hear, hear you. You can? Yes. I love you. I, I love you, Jackie. I love this you. This is the first time I get to say anything and you can't say anything. Because I can't hear you. Up, okay, watch. Up on top, slide your thing up on top. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, wait, can, can you, you see, see me? me? Yes. <laughs> Toggle okay. mic, it says. So, so up, up on. on. That, that didn't work. work. No. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, God. I'll sign, have to sign it. All right, wait a second. All right, let's wait. Let's try something else. There's Karen. Hi, Hello. Karen. Something's Hi, Karen. happening. Not me. <laughs> There. there. <laughs> All right. There. So you can hear her and you can hear her, but you can't hear me. I can, I can hear you. You can I hear can me. Hear. Mm -hmm. And it's you, you <laughs> ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> what should I do? I don't Why know. Audio audio help. Help. I looked at that. It's no help. <laughs> it says, you know, like disable the Fravis and uh, launch the yeah. uh, egregious matter. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I, I know. know. Check, Check your, your camera, camera and mic. Mic. If, if you're, you're already denied access, access. Watch, watch the video above. above. Watch the video. Read, read the handbook. <laughs> when that happens on Zoom, Zoom. when you get that feedback, I think. Now, now, I'm I'm on me. now you got feedback. I don't, I don't know. know. It's going to be all right. We have plenty of time. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Let's not have a phone call right now. I gotta check, check my, my mic, mic on Comcast Chrome. Mic. This is so, so weird. weird. I've never, never had, had a problem with this on Zoom ever. I was gonna, I was gonna say, say on Zoom. Zoom. Hello. Usually, Usually what it is, is you've got, got your. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna go. go. Gonna go. Oh, everyone can see us, so we're supposed to stop. That. Everyone's all right. We have to like leave or something. Well, we aren't doing anything bad. 
Anything in that? that? <laughs> All right. Let me just mute this a minute and. So, okay, um, the sound is good and the face is visible and my mic seems to be working. So, save settings. Okay, I'm gonna say something and it seems to be fine when I'm here by myself. So we'll see what happens when. Okay. okay, there I am. And now I have to find Karen and Anne. Sorry. It's okay. 
we have to end promptly at eight now because uh, we started too early. But no one will ever remember that. <laughs> um, Jackie, before you came on, I was on by myself and I spoke and it was not echoey. At least uh, it seems. I just have to share a screen with you. Can you do that? Or how do we do that? There you go. Hello. Oh, perfect. We're perfect. Now Ann will be back and and the the tech person is all upset. So this is all I may be able to clip the broadcast. So this is this has never happened before. <laughs> People are always saying that to me. <laughs> you're, 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 I don't know, I don't know what, but, 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 but you know, my, my wife is doing this. this thing. Thing. Can, can does it sound odd to you? Now it does again. Yes. Yeah. yes. Oh, wait. I know what to do. Okay, you want me to talk? I sound fine. I, I can't, can't hear you. Right. When I'm live, you get echoey. So I'll mute myself when you're talking. Okay. said that, wait, just a minute. We'll pretend this is a reading in a bookstore and they've said, well, you know, there's a game on tonight. So not that many people might show up and it's raining. So that's always, all right, no, I cannot see you. Anne's trying to sort this out. We'll, all, we'll get it all sorted out. Mm-hmm. Let me try to invite her again. It says she's accepted and is connecting. Hmm, nay. We can't see or hear you. She's going to do the entrance email click again, and that'll probably sort things out. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I finished the revision of my novel today. Nice. And sent it to Jeff. I incorporated all your suggestions. And so I'm sure it will be a big hit. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, I hope so, too. How long have you been working on it? Not too long, about a year and a year and two months. Mm -hmm. Rather shorter than before, than many other times in my life. Yeah. yeah. I hope this is interesting, at least moderately interesting to anybody who's listening in, but some of them are probably would-be writers. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, takes, it takes about, about a year, year and a half to write a book. Me too, usually. And, and the first, first six months, months, I'm finding, finding the story. story. You know, well, I start over many, many times. times. And I, I shift, shift to the main character. It's a process. <laughs> then once I get all that in place, then I just run with it.
Karen, is your computer near to you? Well, of course it is, because you're on the screen. Good God. Um, can you send Ann the link you used to get in? Yes. To Ann Garvin? I told I told them that this would end up like the equivalent of a sausage making factory. <laughs> right, I think she's going to be able to do it now. We'll see. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure if the same, same link will work, work quite, quite because it's, it's, it's like I can sign in as me. Is me. I'm going to stop my video for a second.
I'm back, Jackie. I just sent the uh, email to Anne. It was, it was my internet. My internet's internet's a little low. I invited her on screen also, so she should be okay. able to, to join go. now. I don't know. Wait. And enable your video. Now you can't see me. Right. right. This is an annoying. <laughs> there I am. Okay. Well, I don't know what to do. I think we better start. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I can see Anne as well. Or is she there? Is she, is she, uh, is she at least um can you hear her? I, can you hear her no, no when, when i click on people, people, people i can, I can see a list of people, people. And, it and it says, says 56, 56 appeared, three appeared past tense on screen and ann garvin is the second one down on that list so i think that means she's here I think that her uh, link was disabled. But let's just say this about that. Okay. Um, I just want to say hello and welcome to tonight's Lit Talk. My name's Jacqueline Mitchard, and I'll be having a conversation tonight with Karen Dion. And, uh, and I hope Ann Garvin, we're having a little 
technological issue. And uh, I want to thank Jotham Varilla, uh, the Lit Talks curator and the literary festival staff and sponsors for making this possible. And I'm going to introduce Karen Dion. Karen Dion's the USA and number one international best-selling author of the award-winning psychological suspense novel, The Marsh King's Daughter, published by G.P. Putnam and Sons in the U.S. and 25 other countries. Her next novel of psychological suspense, which we'll hear about tonight, The Wicked Sister, hits bookstore shelves August 4th. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Hi Jackie. I'm, I'm really happy, happy to be here. I'm really happy that you're there. You have to tell us, um, well, first I want to ask you, if uh, if you'll read from this new novel, which I have read, not very many people have read, but which I have read, and I'd like you to read a few pages from it for our audience so that they can get the uh, the flavor of why they should love it and fear it. That sounds great. And you're gonna. Oh, my voice is okay. Did you mute yourself? All right. <laughs> I'm having a little, a little trouble. trouble. Okay, so just to give a little context, um, The Wicked Sister, uh, here's the cover, <laughs> is, uh, it tells the story of Rachel Cunningham, who, um, she, as the story opens, she's living in a mental hospital. She grew up in a beautiful log cabin, hunting lodge, over-the-top, magnificent, copper roof, stained glass windows, uh, on an isolated piece of acreage in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness. And her parents were wildlife biologists. And she has a very deep connection to the land and to nature and so forth. The reason she's in a mental hospital is because uh, there was a tragic accident, a shooting accident when she was 11 and her parents were killed. And she believes that she's responsible. And so um, this, is how, this is how the story begins. Okay, this is in Rachel's voice. She says, sometimes when I close my eyes, there is a rifle in my hands. My hands are small, my fingers are pudgy. I'm 11 years old. There's nothing special about this particular rifle, nothing to distinguish it from any other Remington, except that this is the rifle that killed my mother. In my vision, I am standing over my mother. The rifle is pointing at her chest. Her mouth is open and her eyes are closed. Her chest is red. My father runs into the front hallway. Rachel, he screams when he sees me. He drops to his knees, gathers my mother in his arms, looks up at me, his expression an unfamiliar jumble of shock and horror. He rocks my mother for a long time as if she is a baby, as if she is alive. At last, he lays her gently on the worn parquet floor and gets slowly to his feet. He takes the rifle from my trembling hands and looks at me with a sorrow greater than I can comprehend and turns the rifle on himself. Not so, says the golden orb spider from the middle of her web in a corner of my room where the cleaners never sweep. Your father killed your mother and then he killed himself. I don't understand why the spider is lying. Spiders normally tell the truth. How do you know I can't resist asking? She wasn't there when my parents died. I was. The spider regards me solemnly from eight shiny eyes. I know, she says, we all know. Her spiderlings skitter about the edges of the web as insubstantial as dust motes and nod. I want to tell the spider that she is wrong, that I know better than anyone what happened the day my parents died, and I understand the consequences of my childhood crime better than she ever will because I've been living with them for 15 years. Once you've taken someone's life, it breaks you, shatters you into so many infinitesimal pieces that no one and nothing can put you together again. Ask any drunk driver who killed a pedestrian, any hunter who thought the friend or brother-in-law he shot was a deer, anyone who held a loaded rifle when she was too young to anticipate what was about to happen. My therapists say I'm suffering from complicated grief disorder and promise I'll get better in time. My therapists are wrong. I'm getting worse. I can't sleep, and when I do, I have nightmares. I get frequent headaches, and my stomach hurts all the time. I used to think constantly about killing myself until I realized that living in a mental hospital for the rest of my life is the greater punishment. I eat, I sleep, I read, I watch TV, I go outside. 
I breathe the warm summer air, feel the sun on my skin, listen to the birds chirp and the insects hum, watch the flowers bloom and the leaves turn and the snow fall, and through it all, always, always in the front of my mind and deep in my heart burns this terrible truth. I am the reason my parents will never see, smell, taste, laugh, or love again. My parents are dead because of me. The police ruled my parents' deaths a murder-suicide perpetrated by my father. All the news reports I've been able to find agree. Peter James Cunningham, age 45, murdered his wife, Jennifer Marie Cunningham, age 43, for undetermined reasons, and then turned the rifle on himself. Some speculate that I saw my father shoot my mother, and that's why I ran away. Others, that I found my parents' bodies, and this is what sent me over the edge. I would have told them that I was responsible if I had been able to speak. When I came out of my catatonia three weeks later, I made sure that everyone who would listen knew what I had done. But to this day, no one believes me, not even the spider. So as you can see, the novel starts with um, Rachel in a bit of a dark place, <laughs> mentally and emotionally. And it's no big secret. And it's no big secret that fairly early on in the novel, um, she finds out evidence that she couldn't have done this terrible thing. And so she goes back to her childhood home in a quest for answers, not realizing that there is still danger in her home because that's the kind of books I write. <laughs> Yeah, what's a yeah? What's a nice lady like you doing writing books like that? Those, <laughs> I bet people ask you that all the time because you you uh, your manner is so sweet and loving, and you look like um, uh, the kind of person who would be writing um, lovely cookbooks or something like that, or or Italian uh, books about ro uh, romance in Italy. I know. I, know. I, I don't, I can't explain why I have a dark side, but I do. My, my middle daughter, when, um, she, after she read the Marsh King's daughter, she said she really loved the book, but she says it kind of creeped her out that her mother thought of those things. Uh, my kids say all the time, whenever they read a book that I have written, that they can't believe that there are parts in it that have to do with death and sex and things like that, because that's just, not how they see me. Not, they don't see me as a, as a fully adult human being. Um, <laughs> when um, the Marsh King's daughter enjoyed an enormous success, and, um, and tell me a little bit about, one of the things that we were thinking about, talking about tonight, was about people who, and there are many, many people like this, wrote and published their breakout book after the age of 35 or even 45. And um, I, wonder, up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you would talk about that a little bit because my, my MFA students ask me all the time, gee, if you don't break into this game by the time you're 30, you're through. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that because the beautiful thing about writing is it doesn't matter what your age is. Nobody sees the author. They see the words on the page and the worlds that you create. And I do think that an older writer brings something more to the page because we bring the sum total of our life experience. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter was my fourth published novel but it was the first novel that got so much attention. In fact, you could, I, I frequently say, you would have to combine all my previous publishing experience and then supersize it to equal what's happened for The Marsh King's Daughter. My other novels weren't published in multiple countries and, and they certainly weren't reviewed in the New York Times, which, which The Marsh King's Daughter was. But I think it's really interesting because The Marsh King's, the, the review, the New York Times review said of The Marsh King's Daughter, uh, first words out of the reviewer's mouth were the, that the book was um, subtle, brilliant, and mature. Yes, yes. And so um, subtle, I was happy about that because I do feel like parts of the story are underwritten and a lot is open to the reader's interpretation. And of course, brilliant. That, who wouldn't like to hear that? <laughs> but mature, he, he recognized that there was a maturity to the writing, you know, that comes with someone a little bit older. So, um, yeah, I have had, I've, I've seen a couple of YouTube um, reviews of my book where, you know, the young person who's reviewing it, you know, opens to my picture in the back and he's like, 
can you believe this nice lady, nice grandmother? Oh, sweet old lady. That's what somebody said. He said look, this, look, horrible, this horrible book. book. I was ready to strangle him. So I'm not that sweet. <laughs> well, you're pretty sweet. Um, right, you're not right, that old. Sorry, but not, but not <laughs> I, uh, I too, uh, I was, well, I was 40 when my first novel was published. And at that time, that was so noteworthy that uh, it was written about like in Time Magazine. You know, can you believe that she wrote this story and she can still chew her own food? Um, it, uh, it, it, and, but the world has turned since then. And I know many, many uh, accomplished writers whose, uh, whose first or first or breakout novel was published when they were, uh, when that person was, well, I said many, so it's okay to say they, when they were well into their uh, 40s and 50s, as many um, authors in the past were, we just never knew. You right, know, right. we didn't know about Boris Pasternak, and we didn't know about uh, those other people. Um, but, but, um, uh, mature, mature is a word that has been used, and I don't know. I mean, the wonderful reviewer, my pal Charlie Finch. Um, I don't know if everybody else just copied his review from the New York Times, but uh, but many uh, writers have mentioned that there is a restraint, uh, that there was a restraint and and a maturity to this book that was refreshing to them. To the Marsh King's daughter. Yeah. People have act, asked me, because it is psychological suspense, and it delves very deeply into the relationship between Helena and her father. Um, in The Wicked Sister, I'm obviously working with the relationship between sisters. But people have asked me if I have a degree in psychology, which I do not. But again, it's the sum total of all of that life experience. You know, I had children myself. I was a child. I've watched my friends raise children. And I've, I've always, when, when I have a reaction to something, I always wanted to know why, why did I think that? Why did I, do I feel this way? And so, you know, all of that life experience is the only way to put it, you know, comes forward when you write a book. So. If you're, um, it, one other thing that I wanted to ask you about was something that we've talked about before, which is the unexpected. And editors often say, give me something that I've never seen before, but something that also seems deeply familiar to me, uh, as if that's not kind of a tall order, but that will knock my socks off, but also feel make me feel that I've come home and I'm seeing it home with, with new eyes. What, um, when I try to do something unexpected in a book of mine to make it feel authentic, what I usually end up doing is looking at what might happen in ordinary life and then twisting that mm -hmm. so that something happens that, uh, well, if we weren't writing about extraordinary life, we wouldn't be writing a novel. We would just be having That's lunch. Right. Yeah. And I would say, like in the excerpt that I just read uh, from The Wicked Sister. So Rachel starts in a very dark place, you know, overwhelmed with guilt. And I've done a lot of research on this. And, you know, people who have accidentally killed someone, it's just it just ruins their life. You know, they never are free of that. So um, when it gets to the point where the spider contradicts her, you know, I didn't sit down and think to myself, Oh, I think I'll have a talking spider in my story, you know, but it, it just felt like at that point I was, I was in such a dark place and I wanted to lighten it up a little bit, lighten the mood a little bit. But I also think it's completely unexpected. Uh, I, I read that opening page a long time ago to my editor when we were having lunch at a, uh, at a conference and his head snapped up when, when I, read that part about the spider. So I think it's really important, you know, as an author to have something in there that I think promises surprise, it promises a, a, a skill at storytelling, you know, that the reader can just kind of settle back and say, okay, this, this is going to be an interesting book. 
Uh, I well, people are surprised to learn from me that I really like spiders, and I like them to be around the house in part because they're those little predators and they get rid of all the other bugs that I don't like as much. But when people ask me what my favorite character in literature is, I say Charlotte A. Kavitica <laughs> because she was a well. Look who's come to oh my gosh. <laughs> You certainly know how to enter with a bang, Ann Garvin. <laughs> She's still, still not talking. Oh, really? Still no? Oh, okay. okay. Okay, Ann Garvin is here, but apparently in a nuclear reactor. Um, I, uh, I, um, turn your mic off just for a minute so that I can introduce you, cutie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we have Ann Garvin, Dr. Ann Garvin, the USA Today bestselling author of I Like You Just Fine When You're Not Around. She is a prolific, um, funny, poignant writer. Uh, founder of the Tall Poppy Writers, which is an organization of women writers who support each other in uh, creative and also in the business sense. And her next novel, her upcoming novel, I thought you said this would work, uh, will come to Bookshore Shelves in April 2021. And I'm going to ask Anne, who did a yeoman's job in getting into this podcast, she actually drove to Connecticut from Wisconsin. She is in the studio now. Um, in, and um, uh, if she will read a few pages from, I thought you said this would work. Try, and, and I'm going to mute myself so that it doesn't sound like we're at Chernobyl. Um, and here I go. Welcome, Anne. All right, okay. Okay, awesome. But I'm going to read from I Like You Just Fine When You're Not Around, only because that book doesn't come out for a year, and we only just sent the edits back, and they don't even have the commas in yet. So and okay. I can okay. guarantee that I didn't put the commas in right. Okay, so I won't. I don't think I need to say anything about the book, but um, <laughs> should I say a little about the book? Okay. Well, it, the book is about um, a woman who is really obsessed with the idea of life should be fair and it's not fair and uh, we all know it's not fair but she can't let that go and so this um she spends a lot of time with her mother who has alzheimer's which is the most unfair disease of all diseases um you get to stay around forever but you you aren't really around at all and um which is one of the places where the title i i like you just fine when you when you're not around came from um, and this first scene is um, the protagonist, Tig Monahan, is uh, with her mother in the nursing home. Um, and um, the chapter one is um, Horn Broken, Look for Finger. Tig Monahan tried to imagine what it would be like to lose her mind. Was it a quick, fully aware, terror-filled slip on an icy sidewalk or slower where a tiny skidding sensation goes unnoticed and suddenly you realize all four limbs are in the air and your face is in the ditch? You realize with your mother, Hallie Monahan, it's hard to tell what she'd been aware of or how the knotted neurons in her brain foretold her foggy future. Either way, her mother's mind was not her own. Her secrets were locked inside, and Tig was left to ponder the icy aftermath. It was almost 6 p.m., and Hallie's nightly agitation was right on time, actually a half hour ahead of schedule due to the recent relocation from Tig's home to Hope House. Where is she? Her mother said, her voice flapping like a bird startled from its roost. Is your father here? Hallie worked the worn platinum wedding band loose beneath her knuckle around and around again. He said I should wait. She shoved the bedside stand out of the way and stood, the evening version of her dementia giving her a kind of agility that her laid-back daytime confusion seemed to eschew. It's okay, Mom. I'm here. I've got you. Her mother emptied her purse on the bed. Wendy, get your father. It's Tig, Mom. Tig, the forgotten daughter and sister to Wendy the absent Monaghan. 
said. What are you looking for? Hallie stopped in her frantic search through her purse and snapped. What do you think I'm looking for? It's always right here in this pocket. Her piercing blue eyes were clearly seeing one daughter where the other one stood, reminding Tig of how sure her mother had been, sure and blunt and lovely. Her signature soft blonde hair now frayed and wild, white, her lips full, yet once turned inward with the sourness of age. Miss Pa, her mother said, changing from agitation to despondency to French, a language she loved and remembered better than her family. She snatched Tig's hand in her pale fist. Tig worked to keep her own anxiety locked inside, knowing that when she cried, it only upset her mother. We can't all cry, her mother used to say when Tig and Wendy were girls. Someone has to man the battle stations. Tig struggled against her grief, her lips twitching in effort. A nurse swept into the room, responding to the call bell. Tig had silently rung for assistance. Over her mother's head, Tig said, I thought maybe tonight she wouldn't need a sedative. I thought if maybe I spent the whole day with her, it might help. The nurse drew a line with her lips and looked sympathetically at Tig as if to say, here's another one who just doesn't get it. Another relative really low on the learning curve. Alzheimer's softens for no man, no how, no way. It's been one week. She was at your house for much longer than that. She needs time to acclimate. To Tig's mother, she said, Hallie, Let's get you settled for the night. Hallie Monahan ignored the nurse and began tearing at her sheets. Tig said, my mom ran her own business. She was a vet and a single parent. You have no idea how much she would hate being seen like this, hate being here. The nurse spoke to Hallie in a tone that made Tig want to curl up on the wrinkled bedding for a nap. Hallie, love, I have your medication here. Try some orange juice. Here you go. Inexplicably, inexplicably, Hallie turned, flipped the small pill into her mouth, and slammed back orange juice like a drunk in a biker bar. I always say after I read that that the book is kind of funny. And, and yeah. We can see that. Um, you have a reputation as a writer who writes uh, effortlessly, and I know it's not effortless, effortlessly writes beautifully funny um, a darkly funny, wickedly funny, uh, witty novels, and certainly uh, there's an example of it that that you just read that made me want to lie down on the bed sheet and cry as well. But it is the emotion that's contained there is extraordinarily powerful and poignant. And I don't think I mean I've I've read very few books. Lisa Genova's book is one of them um, uh, about uh, about Alzheimer's that has um, that have as eloquently conveyed what that's like. <laughs> yeah, I you know the thing about Alzheimer's or even so I was a nurse for a lot of years and the thing about illness is it's embarrassing and painful, but because it's embarrassing and painful, it's often can be very funny. Um, and because anything embarrassing is a little bit funny. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with my own mother who had Alzheimer's, unfortunately, or fortunately, so I read, I wrote this book before she was really in the grips of it. But I had worked with um, the elderly for a long time. And you just, sometimes indignity is funny. Um, and it's sometimes the only way that you can manage these things that are so unbelievably difficult. I mean, there's just so many tears in the world, right? But uh, I think that the laughter is the only way that you can make yourself work through it. Your mom was extraordinarily accomplished. She was a person who uh, had a, a full personal and professional life and was bright and and we just, as you said in your excerpt, uh, Alzheimer's does, it has no favorites. It picks whoever it chooses to pick. And, uh, and with, an, with an extraordinary, um, with an extraordinary and uh, extraordinary ruthlessness. Um, I want to ask you before um, 
uh, I'm going to ask you each a couple of questions and you're going to like mute your, I'm going to mute myself when you're talking. This is all going to go just great from here on. Um, it, um, I want to ask you about tall poppies and just briefly tell us why it is, why that if, um, that women writers sort of in the world don't get, um, the same amount of marketplace support and uh, reviewing support. I'm going to ask you each this question and don't even pretend that it's not true, people out there who are listening and disagree, because it really is. We were talking today, actually, Anne and I, about the fact that Tom Parada, you know, wrote about a woman who had feelings and they made like a 75 part series about it and then wrote a book about a father who was helping to raise his children. Get out of here. Um, when, when guys do those things, it is unexpected and it's lauded when they write about those things. When women do it, you're supposed to know that stuff. So would you talk about that a little bit, Annie? So, you know, um, I came at writing much after you two and, um, and one of the things that was a learning curve for me was to understand how different it was for men and women um, as far as the publishing dollar and how that would stretch forward. I think, um, you know, I think it's just systematic sexism. It's, it's the way it has always been, and it's always hard to get out of the way that it's always been. I think women's voices has always been muted. Um, for many reasons in all ways, so why would publishing be any different from that? Um, I think that it's, it's particularly difficult, I think, for us in publishing to swallow that because the largest percentage of our readership is women, um, and yet we give women fewer awards for their writing, fewer... So we're sort of disrespecting the, the female author as well as disrespecting the female reader, even though it's really the author, the female author, and the female reader that's keeping the publishing world going because we, they're the readers and, you know, disproportionately there are female authors as well. So when I, um, when I really recognized this, so I came, as I said, I came to it a little bit later and, and you know, when I, when my first book came out, I thought, oh good, a beach house. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I barely got another deal. And um, I know you, know you both know how difficult that can be. And, um, and I thought, this is crazy. We, if, if we can band together as um, women authors, if we can band together to help each other, there's no way that we're not going to be able to um, make a stronger footprint in the publishing world. And, and we should stop acting like there, if there's a scarcity situation where there's only one person that can reach to the top. We know that's not the case. And, and women are so good at community. So why not take what's natural to us create a group that works really, their whole mission is to help women and then just keep going. And that's, that's what's going on for me. That screeching noise <laughs> to, to introduce me asking another question. Yes, I, now when I write a book, I hope to afford a beach towel um, as well as, a well, maybe two beach towels. Um, Anyway, uh, I would like to ask Karen the same question or, or to meditate a little bit on that same topic. And, uh, and I am sitting here right now kicking myself because I sometimes feel when I talk about things like that, that I'm being the stereotypical whiny feminist, you know, that, oh, we, no one pays attention to us. And, um, but these these things are true and they need repeating and more than repeating they need fixing they need fixing right and proper in the publishing world so that uh so that women don't have to use their first two initials so that people aren't really sure whether it's a guy writing this gritty uh novel or a woman Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that because as as I was thinking, how would I address this from my own personal experience? My first two novels were science-based thrillers, similar to what Michael Crichton writes. Um, I 
liked techno thrillers. These ended up being cast as environmental thrillers, but yeah, they were definitely, um, they had a lot, a, a lot of women readership, but they were more closer to what we would think of as guy books. The first novel was published under my name, Karen Dion. And it didn't do as well as the publisher had hoped. And so they wanted me to publish the next one as K.L. Dion because they thought maybe men didn't pick up the novel because it was written by a woman. Um, I went along with that. It didn't help. <laughs> um, you know, the, the book didn't do well either. And my publisher dropped me at that point. I think now what we're seeing, one one aspect I want to comment on is I think women have come to their own in certain genres or subgenres, like for instance, psychological suspense, which is what I'm currently writing. Um, you know, you can name a whole raft of women who are being now very successful at writing psychological suspense, starting with Gillian Flynn and, and Gone Girl. And I only know one or two guys who are writing psychological suspense. So um, I, I feel like maybe just, you know, the, the more ordinary aspects of women's life are not being considered with as much respect in publishing. But if you happen to go down the road, you know, of the thriller-ish, you know, the, the psychological aspect, you're actually in a, in a sweet spot. And of course, it was after I changed from writing environmental thrillers to psychological suspense that my novel broke out so hugely. So women behaving in a twisted way is what we're going for. Women behaving badly, not nurturing, not mothers, killers, um, killers and sort of, you know, um, people who cheat on their husbands and then kill the nanny in the woods, which, which you do. I mean, you know, which people do all the time. I live in Cape Cod and you can, can't imagine the woods are littered with, uh, people that have been killed by their unfaithful spouses. I shouldn't say that now, you know, now the next three days, all I'll get is 50, 150 emails from people. Anyway, um, I want to ask you each another question that uh, that I get asked all the time, and it's not going to be, how do you get your ideas for books? I'm not going to give you that one, um, though I'd like to share how I got the idea for my most recent one because it's very sad. Um, I'm going to ask you if you think writing is fun, if you enjoy the process, and while you're doing it, you're having a hell of a good time, comparable perhaps to having chocolate ice cream or drinks with me. Yeah. Uh, is, is, is challenging, challenging difficult. difficult? One at a, One time, at a time, time, Karen first. Karen first, then Anne. Writing is fun about five percent of the time <laughs> when everything clicks when everything's going right you know when your characters are surprising you on the page and or you're you're the part i love the best is when you're three quarters of the way through the novel and you get an idea and you realize that all along you laid the groundwork for that idea you know everything was there your subconscious was leading you to that point and you didn't consciously know it and so then it's like oh well, I could do this and this and this, and everything just falls beautifully into place. Or, you know, a beautiful sentence, or you fall into the rhythm of the character and, and, and you're really running with it. When I was writing The Marsh King's Daughter, I woke up in the night with the first sentences of the book fully formed in my head. And the next morning I expanded on that. And so um, really with The Marsh King's Daughter, it was, it was very unusual for me. It was the sixth book that I had written. And it was almost like the character came to me fully formed. And so it was definitely the easiest book to write too. But easy or hard, I've, I've heard other writers say this too. Sometimes their best books were not the easiest ones to write. So um, it can be challenging. I think one of the things about writing that I find challenging is that every sentence, every word, every paragraph is a decision. 
you know, are you going to use a, an adjective here? Are you going to end a sentence on a hard and a soft note? And what's going to happen plot wise? You know, it's it's just a constant process of decisions. How is this going to advance the story? And that's fun, but it also can be very challenging. I'll, I'll stop here and let Anne make a comment. I I would really like to echo what what um, Karen said because all of that is absolutely my experience as well. You know, I had a great time writing my first book. <laughs> like that was so fun. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, how hard it was. Um, you know, that kind of thing when you really are entirely arrogant, thinking that you can do it, and then and you don't know how wrong you are. That was a lot of fun. Um, and, and sometimes like I really, there are things that I love to do. Um, and, uh, Jackie says that someday we're going to get a t-shirt made for me that says not everything is funny. And, and, um, I, I have this tendency to have a really good time. And I've even had my agent say to me, stop having such a good time. You're having a really good time right here. Stop it. Because I will, you know, I'll do anything for the joke. And, um, then they end up getting cut out. So uh sometimes though there are days when when it is really fun it's a lot of fun and you sort of know where you're going and and the words come easy but i i would say um for the most part it's much harder than i thought it was going to be and on many a day uh i i spend a lot of time thinking i know that i wrote two or three books before i know i i've done this um and sometimes i have to read my own work to remind myself that I can do it um, before I can get back in there and write it again. Uh, I'm kind of a sophomore compared to you guys, uh, but I, it doesn't seem like it changes. And, and, and I, I, I say that just, I say that only because I recognize what you said, Karen. It's all similar for me. It's always been suffering for me, all suffering all the time in a general way. and. And when I suffer most, sometimes I turn to Ann Garvin or Karen Dion and say, what in the actual, what do I do now other than move to a different country and change my name because I cannot finish this story and I just don't know where to go. And I know that I know many writers. I know many good writers who absolutely bubble over with solutions to the kinds of problems that I face every day and have a very difficult time facing down and lose sleep over. Uh, Anne once told me that I think that my um, novels were like big things made out of Legos and I was always trying to take a yellow Lego out and put a blue Lego in without it falling down on my face and, and injuring me. And sometimes I feel like that as though that as though it's not a headlong, breathless, joyous process. It's like break it's like finding the statue within the the block of of concrete or not concrete, um, granite. First For <laughs> No, I just want to say one thing, I, and I think that sometimes readers um, will read a book and they'll think, I can see the flaw in this book, I can write a better book. Um, and I think that gives the impression that if you can figure out what's wrong with a book or a flaw in a book, that you could do a better job. Not realizing that so much is going right in that book that you can pick out the one thing that maybe didn't work. Um, and that's a pretty successful book, uh, even, because all books have a flaw in it. But I, and I probably, you know, had the same delusion when I first started writing a book thinking, well, I know these other books and I was able to pick out what was wrong with them. I bet I could write a book that didn't have that, which I've never done. Of course, there's a flaw in every book. But, you know, I, I think that there's so much going on to make a book work, um, but you don't see it if the book is working. And so it's... Well, it's people thinking they can write a book. Yeah. I, I would add to that, that I always read my, when I get the hard copy, I always read them. I, I start just looking at the first couple of paragraphs. Oh, this looks pretty good. Next thing I know, I'm reading the whole thing. And what I think is so interesting is 
I re I remember the parts I really struggled with, right? You know, and I'm like, well, this reads fine. What what was so hard <laughs> about that? You know, so so that's been my experience consistently across the board. You know, when I when I read my books in finished form, you know, they seem they seem to just flow, and and I like I say, I remember those places that I really struggled and and was unsure about, but um, yeah, they're fine in the end. <laughs> I rem when when I think about writing and how difficult it is for me, I will say this is that I am so happy in that particular form of misery because it is unlike um, other people here, you guys. I've never had another thing that I, I this is the only thing I can do. It's the only thing that I've ever done. I did it first as a newspaper reporter and then as a magazine journalist and then as a book writer and I really have no other abilities or talents it's the only thing that I can do um, that pa pasta sauce I can make a really great pasta sauce but um, and I can I know all the lyrics to all the songs since 1940 but I don't know how to harness that it but in that misery I am happier and more fulfilled than I am doing things that other people might call enjoyment. Uh, I, I guess it's a, it's a, a paradox. I want to ask um, each of you another question, um, and that is, what's something that's coming up in your next book that people will not expect from reading your books before? And this time we'll We'll ask Karen to start. Okay, so I'm calling my next book The Wicked Sister because that's the one that comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, what's something in there that people won't expect? Um, well, The Marsh King's Daughter is kind of, because it was my breakout book, that's that's my standard, you know, so so my readership is is based on that book. And one thing that I did in that novel, which was a little bit different, was um, the whole novel roughly parallels a fairy tale by the same name. Uh, the Marsh King's Daughter is the name of a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. And so um, it's told all in one point of view. Um, the Helena there's a story in the present and a story in the past, but it's all, you know, in her voice and, and through her filter. And so um, in The Wicked Sister, I changed that up a little bit in that um, I still have a story set in the present and story set in the past, but it's two first person narrators. And so in the present, from the excerpt that I read at the beginning, that's Rachel, who is uh, going home after so many years in the mental hospital to try to figure out what really happened to her family. And then the other voice is Jenny, her mother. Uh, even though the reader knows from the first page that Jenny is dead, <laughs> I give her a first person voice, obviously up to the moment <laughs> where she is, is no more. And I think um, for me, that's what gives the story meaning and depth because the past always informs the present. And so Jenny is able to tell basically the events that led up to this family tragedy. And it's, so it's kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a runaway train, you know, uh, events are happening and um, the reader can clearly see where it's going, but Jenny, the mother cannot because, uh, you know, that's how it often is in life. So I, I think, fans of The Marsh King's Daughter are going to find the structure a little different. Also, I don't directly parallel a fairy tale, although I like to think that the, the novel itself is almost like a fairy tale. It takes place in this beautiful log cabin in the woods, which is kind of like the castle in the forest. And um, there's my character, obviously, she thinks she can talk to animals. And, and you know, that's a, a constant feature in fairy tales, right? The animals can usually talk and, and advise humans and so forth. So I'm playing with that, too. And um, a lot of other aspects. Rachel obviously has a sister because the book is called The Wicked Sister. And so the two girls will often act out fairy tales as, as uh, a way to play together in the forest. So there's this constant undercurrent of, of the fairy tale theme running through the book. But I hope readers will come away feeling like they, I almost just told them a fairy tale. So that's, that's what's a little different about the upcoming book. Okay, Anne, tell us something to surprise us.
Um, well, so this book, I thought you said it would work, is about um, three best friends from college, and there was a falling out um, with two of them, and they are now being called into uh, action. They have to go and rescue their best friend's dog from um, her ex-husband that lives across, all the way in California. So I'm billing it sort of um, as Little Miss Sunshine meets Thelma and Louise. And I think people are going to expect it to be, you know, a romp because in, in a way it is. It's a road trip with uh, three women, but two of them pretty much hate each other. Um, I, this is the first term, time I've used first person. And uh, I, yeah, I usually do third close. And so this is uh, first person and the other two women that are in the car really it's a ensemble piece it's not really just about this one woman um and i again i mine some pretty heavy topics in it um lots of topics that ruin friendships that go along with miscommunication but also misunderstanding all kinds of the greatest things that ruin friendships um i think my biggest uh, difficulty in this book was to make a book, um, a book you might want to read with three women fighting in a car all the way. <laughs> um, but there's a gigantic dog in it, of course, and um, of course, and um, as there would be. Um, but also there's a D-list celebrity that um, that sort of is the comic relief in the book so that you don't have to spend the whole time with fighting women. Um, and so I think that's really different. What's different is that it's a strong ensemble piece that's on the move. Um, in the past, I've chosen a town and a woman um, who's really making a lot of trouble in that town. Um, and instead, I have these other characters, these three really strong women who have to put up with each other in a Prius with a huge dog for thousands and thousands of miles. And that is something new and different for me. Um, it was fun. But again, I think we go back to that part of the question of what was fun about writing. <laughs> if you... All right, I'm going to ask you not what your favorite book is. I, I mean, that's a different question. What's the book that if you could have written it, you wish you could have written it? I mean, what the a book that's like, and don't say... Anna Karenina, you know, I mean, I'm not going to take that. Um, it has to be something that is relatively in the world of now. But um, what is a book that you so deeply admire that um, that you that it's sort of your dream book to have written? And I have an answer to this, too. Karen first. Well, this is actually fairly easy for me because this is the book that helped me write the Marsh King's Daughter. And the book is called The Snow Child by A.O. and Ivy. And it's a beautiful book. Um, it also parallels roughly the fairy tale, The Snow Child. It's set in the 1920s Alaska. Uh, Eowyn homesteaded herself in Alaska. So she really knows the area. And the story is, is it's literary fiction is so well done. It's so engaging. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And it's her debut novel. So you know it's a beautiful novel. Her, her subsequent novel is also really beautiful too. So it's just like, it's an engaging story, but she uses such beautiful language and I find it really inspiring. So actually the progression for, for the Marsh King's daughter was, I woke up in the night with the character talking to me. Um, I set the novel the next day in a location that I know well, which is Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I lived there for 30 years. But I still didn't have a story for the character. And so it was at that point that I got my childhood books of fairy tales off the shelf and started paging through them because I was inspired by Eowyn's book. And when I found the fairy tale, The Marsh King's Daughter, the fit was so perfect for the character who had come to me that, you know, I used that as to form the structure for the story. So, you know, hands down, um, I'll, I'll read everything Eowyn wrote three times in a row. It's, it's beautiful writing. Anne, how about you? You know, I I wish 
I had the ability to write um, as well as uh, Elizabeth Strout in Olive Kitteridge. And um, that book to me, um, it's really one of the one of the best books that has funny and sad or funny and poignant in it. Um, I always say if I, I ever met Olive, I would want to hug her and she would slap me. And that to me is the best kind of character. And um, I want to write, and I really like to write about women who have been pushed too far too many times. And then they've snapped in some ways, like they've just had enough and they start to behave somewhat badly. And that's not really what happens with Olive Kitteridge, but it is a little bit. Like she's really gone through the ringer and she's both funny and sad and desperate and lonely. And, but within all of that, she's funny. Um, and uh, if I could write like her, I, I feel like I'm a poor man's um, Elizabeth Strout when I write, because if I, if I would do anything to sort of get up to her level, because I think it's fantastic. I have to agree with you. Whatever she's going to write, I'm going to read that. And also, whatever Ann Patchett is going to write in a general way, I'm going to read that. I love her stories. I love their uh, their largeness and complexity. And even though they may take place in a very simple uh, location, like the Dutch House, her most recent book, takes place mostly two siblings sitting in a car arguing while they're looking at the house that they used to live in, uh, is they're still large and complex. They're large with emotion. But the book that I would, I wish I would have written is, I don't write science fiction or fantasy or anything like that um, it, and, and have not had uh, too much luck with elements of magical realism in any of the things that I've written, but I would love to have written Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. That's one of my most favorite books, and uh, I love it. I love everything about it, its complexity, its poignancy, and the fact that it sort of creeps up on you that you're reading science fiction. Okay, I'm going to, uh, before our time gets too short, um, I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask another question about. Um, do you think it's important? Do you write with a consciousness of the reader in mind? I'm going to ask each of you this, or are you writing for yourself? I I, I say this because I was once at a dinner. It was in the National Book Awards, actually. And uh, I was sitting at a table with, uh, Oprah Winfrey was the speaker that night. I was sitting at a table with um, lots of women and men who were writers whose books had been Oprahficated, you know, had been anointed by Oprah Winfrey. And one of them, Jane Hamilton, said, uh, this, this, the National Book Awards, is what I would love more than anything the the approval and the esteem of my peers i mean would you rather have that or would you have the approval and esteem of suburban housewives and allison hoffman was sitting next to me on the other side and she and i together i mean as one said suburban housewives every day of the week those are the people who buy books they buy them whether they're for themselves or for their husbands and children, but they are the buyers and readers of consumers of books. And they're smart and tough, and sometimes they're not as um, easy to fool as other writers maybe are. So I'm going to ask Karen to answer this one first, and, uh, and, and then Anne, please. Well, I'd like to say I want both. <laughs> I want critical acclaim and <laughs> happy readers. But um, yeah, when you first started with the question, my first thought that popped into my mind was I'm, I'm writing for the readers. I want to please the readers. And I think it's because as a writer, we have an obligation to readers. We've asked them to give 
you know, part of their time and their life and their money if they buy the book, but they're welcome to take it from the library too. But, you know, we've, we've asked them to invest in our stories. So I feel it's just really important to, you know, part of that pact, that promise is to give them a good story that they want. I read all of my reviews, you know, the Goodreads and the Amazon reviews. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to, but you know, I do. And when I, when I get a bad review, I feel bad for the reader because, you know, they feel like they wasted their time with my story. And, you know, I'm, I feel bad for them. Not so much for me because I know you're not going to please everyone. But uh, yeah, I, I think it all comes down to the readers. Um, it's the same thing as like, now we're able to talk to people, you know, we can't go and do book events in person because of the, the shutdowns. And so um, we're able to connect with readers, readers online, like we're doing right now. And so it's, I just feel like it's a real gift to, as an author, to be able to come out from behind my computer and interact with the readers who are re actually reading my story. So, for um you know i i taught at the university for many years in um health and uh, don't ever try to teach health because nobody wants to hear it but um but one of the things i you know i did kind of recognize that i was t teaching a bunch of people who really are not that interested in health all about health and but my biggest piece of teaching health was i wanted people to understand what it was to be a human and to feel better about being a human and also to feel better as a human but I started thinking that if I wrote fiction, I could really spend more time making people feel better about being a human and showing and talking about um, that life is hard and everybody struggles. And this might be, this is a story about somebody who's struggling and maybe you will feel better about your own struggles if you're reading someone else writing about struggles. That was very inarticulate, but that I write for the readers. I write, I want them to feel better about being human. And then all books are about being human because they're all about somebody who wants somebody who wants something and is struggling to get it. And something is in their way. And so, you know, I really, I hate the notion, the Instagram notion that everybody has a beautiful life. I really love the notion that if we pay attention to other people's struggles, we can feel better about being a human, we can better be better about not being perfect in our own lives. And then also showing people that there is a way to kind of get out of it. So for sure, I write for the readers. They're my people. I, um, I, I often hear from my, you know, I, I teach creative writing. I teach um, I'm in an MFA program, a couple of them. And my uh, my students often say some of them are young, some of them aren't so young. They often, but they often say, "I write for myself. I don't care if it ever gets published." And and I say, "Wow, you know, you're spending twenty seven thousand dollars for you know you for a lot of self enjoyment there." But um, but to me, it a story is meaning meaningless if it isn't published because it is the it's a, like a dance that's not completed until someone else takes your hand and dances with you it's it's the impact on the reader that at the end of the day um really i think underscores all the hard work and the validity of what you tried to say um it, were you able to create recreate a piece of music in a way that someone else could sing the tune um, has always been really important to me as a writer and really validating to me as a writer. And of course, I want critical acclaim as well, just as you guys do. I Anne knows this story. This is my critical acclaim story. When uh, when I wrote my first novel, I took my <clears throat> children. I didn't have that many children then, just a sort of three or four children. And uh, I took them to Italy. We had never been out of the country. It was swell. We went there and had a great time. And on the way back, we were in the airport in New York on the way back to Wisconsin, where I lived then. And the New York Times book review was on the chair in the airport. I picked it up. 
and it was on the jump page, you know, not the front page. And I started reading this review backwards, and I thought, oh, this poor bastard. You know, what? The <laughs> and then when the, then with dawning horror, I realized that this was my book that the person was writing about. So, um, and I guess all publicity is good publicity, but it sure didn't feel like it that day. Okay. Um, we're, uh, we're reaching the point where we're going to have to say goodbye at eight o'clock. And, um, and I want to know, uh, well, two things I want to know. I'll ask Ann first, what's the book that's coming up for you? What's the book that you're writing now? And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and also I want to ask you particularly, uh, as part of that answer to talk about your, your work is often described as women's fiction. What does that even mean? I'm going in the box. Um, okay. Just briefly, the book that is coming up on, um, April 21, 2021 is, I thought you said this would work. Um, the book I'm writing right now is called, so far it's called falling in love is the easy part. Um, but it might be called, um, there's no coming back from this. <laughs> so they're like conflicting titles. Um, and they're set in, um, New York city, uh, during a blackout. Um, and, uh, women's fiction, uh, you know, I mean, it's a great way to help women find my book. It's a great way for people to understand uh, where I might sit on the bookshelf. Um, it's not so good if I want any man to ever read it because um, I think that is a, a closed door for men. Um, I, it's frustrating to me that we don't have men's fiction because it seems like then men is the category. The subcategory then is women's fiction, which annoys me to no end. I think, um, unfortunately, I'll say this just briefly because I know we're running out of time, that the, the genre categories in my mind are really just an organizational thing. They shouldn't be a hierarchy. So we shouldn't say that literary fiction is the best fiction. The next thing is I don't know what. The next thing is I don't know what. You know, whatever it is beneath literary fiction, what they really are is categories and where they sit on the shelf in the bookstore. Unfortunately, they've become a hierarchy. And, and I think that's the dawn of women's fiction. I think that's where it came from. It's a way to put us in a box. So Karen, same thing. Well, the book that I'm working on now, I'm staying with the psychological suspense and not just because it's working for me, but I it's because I think it's the genre that I should have been writing all along. I mentioned how my early novels were environmental thrillers and they had a, a modest amount of success, but certainly nothing like, like The Marsh King's Daughter. But even then there were shades of, you know, creating characters that had moral dilemmas. Like um, my second novel took takes place at an active volcano in Northern Patagonia, Chile, and it follows four character stories that converge separately, that converge at the end in the caldera of the volcano, because, you know, I like noisy things. <laughs> but also at the same time, I deliberately set out to create characters who by the end of the book, each of the four main characters had to make a moral choice between something they believed in and someone they cared about. So you can see, you know, I can see anyway, even at that point, I was nudging towards this idea of, you know, the psychological suspense and the, the psychology of it being more important. And so um, I'm sticking with that because that's that seems to suit me and that's what I like to write and explore. So this third novel that I'm working on now uh, also takes place in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Uh, this one, rather than an isolated cabin in the woods, which I ended up with for my first two books, um, this one, that I'm writing now takes place in a small town on the shore of Lake Superior, uh, because uh, I think small town life is is very interesting. And then, as far as the uh, setting of the book, I'm using Lake Superior because Michigan is surrounded by four of the five Great Lakes, and, and the the Great Lakes are a big part of Michigan life. And so. Uh, my, the Marsh King's Daughter, it featured the marshland. The Wicked Sister takes place in a forest. Now I'm going to uh, have scenes on, on the water. And the section of shoreline where this book takes place 
is sometimes known as the graveyard of the Great Lakes because so many ships have gone down there, including the Edmund Fitzgerald, you know, that, that Gordon Lightfoot sung about. So that might give a little hint as to, to some of the story events. <laughs> but uh, for now, yeah, all my focus is on um, the Wicked Sister. I'm so happy, you know, that I have a follow up to the Marsh King's Daughter. And so far it's being well received, which, you know, is of course so important for an author. So two more weeks. Well, I, we have to say good night now, and I'm so glad that the people in the audience came. I'm so glad that uh, uh, that it all finally worked out with getting people here. I guess it has to end at eight o'clock. I'm not sure about the timing here, but thank you so much, Ann Garvin. Thank you so much, Karen Dion. Thank you so much, readers in the audience. I wish we could answer and ask questions um, in, and we had more time, but we don't tonight. So another time. Keep reading, keep not being sick, keep keep trying to write, keep trying to write wonderful words for people so that we will have their solace as we face this world. Good evening. Thank you, Jotham, and thank you, the Connecticut Literary Festival, too. My goodness. Bye.